You know, it's great uh, coming here, and I was telling some of the folks that have been teaching the Word already how blessed I've been to hear everybody teach. And, you know, over the years I've had a chance to travel and be in a lot of areas and hear people teach the Word. And what's interesting is sometimes you can tell where there's a real depth of the Word and sometimes where they've been taught the Word, but you, you know, it's just kind of a basic overview of the Word. They can teach about maybe believing or they can talk about love or something like that. But what I've seen here this weekend that's blessed me so much is I see the depth of the word. These topics that you're handling this weekend are just really, you could do the whole weekend on each topic. So I've just been really blessed to hear everybody teach and share the word. My wife grew up in a town called Van Wert, Ohio. Some of you may have heard of that. And her family had lived there for years and years. And her grandfather actually was born there and raised on a farm in the area. And um, I might get some water. At the altitude, this is really dries you out. <laughs> so while he was out there back in those days, they didn't have tractors and all that stuff. So what they used were mules or, you know, in that area usually to pull the plows to plow the fields. So he had a couple mules by the name of Jim and Jack that he had taught to plow the fields out there around Van Wert, Ohio. And what he'd do is he would yoke them together, and he had taught, I forget which one was it? Jim was the oldest. Jim was the oldest, so he taught Jim how to lead Jack on the yoke. And what he would do is he, would, he taught Jim to walk around the field, make one pass with the plow, they would pull through, and he taught them over the years how to plow the field by themselves. Wow. And so people, people would come by, drive by in their cars. This was many years ago. <laughs> and they'd see these two mules out there pulling a the plow and making perfect furrows through this whole field. Well, something happened, and Jim went blind. And so what ended up happening is Jack actually took over and started leading Jim, and they continued to plow those fields for years. So when you think about how that worked, and then you start to think about how the one body works, each of us has a part. Sometimes those parts may change. Sometimes they may vary. You know, I got the word when I was 17 years old. I'm 64 now. So over the years, my roles and my positions and my situations have changed. But you know what? At one time, maybe I was leading, and leading uh, the other person next to me. Now I'm being led a lot of times by a lot of people like yourselves. And that's the one body. That's who we are. So we're going to go into the theme verse, which is Colossians, or the theme section anyway, which is Colossians chapter 3. And in verse 15... Let you get there. Most of you probably know this verse by heart anyway. And it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and what? Be ye, Be ye thankful. Wow. Isn't that a great verse? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's exactly what Pete was just talking about, right? We allow that to work in us. We get off the old, if you've got the old man living in your life, you know what? The peace of God is not going to rule. The old man is going to rule in your life. We let that rule to which you are called in one body. Now, why does he put that in there like that? That's an interesting place to put that. And then following it with after being let your heart, uh, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, and then the one body, and then be thankful after that. That's an interesting combination how that's put in there. The one body must be a situation where when it's working right, we are all in peace, letting the peace of God rule in our heart. And when we as one body work together, then we're thankful. Isn't that great? There's another uh, uh, version or translation of this. It's in Phillips, and it reads, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Remembering that as members of the same body, you are called to live in harmony and never forget to be thankful for what God has done for you. Isn't that an interesting translation? 
So we're to remember who we are in the me as members of the body of Christ, and we're to live in harmony with one another, just like Jim and Jack, how they work together. Well, what if one day one of them had said, you know what? I don't like that you're leading, so I'm going to take off and lead this way. How do you think those furrows would have looked in that field? Yeah. Or what if one day Jack got up and said, you know what? I'm tired of pulling this damn plow. I'm not doing it anymore. And Jim's sitting there trying to pull, say, come on, we got to go. we got things to do. Well, her grandfather, Odie, is what we called him, he would have come out there and said, what's going on? Now, you know how you get the attention of a, of a Missouri mule, don't you? With a two-by-four right here. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes in the body of Christ, maybe we need a little of that love of God two-by-four right in the middle of the forehead to get our attention so that we can be thankful for what we are. But if we live in that harmony, in order to truly have the peace of God rule in our hearts, we must live in harmony as one body. So I wanted to go and look at, so uh, you're already in Colossians. We're going to look at this section that uh, Jessica read the other day. So we're going to start in verse 1. And what I want to do is read through this section again. But I want to point out some, uh, some specific things that it says. Because now, remember we're supposed to uh, uh, interpret the word in the verse, in the context, and as it's been used before. But well, we're going to look at this verse where it talks about the one body. We're going to look at it in the context. Because we can read this one verse and pull it out, mount it on our walls, decoupage for those of you that grew up in the 70s. Put it on the walls and do all these things, and it's just fantastic. But you know what? If you don't understand the context, then it doesn't really have as much heart and meaning. It says, Since ye then be risen with Christ, and I'm going to point out certain things. If it was in my Bible and I was underlining, these would be the things I would underline in this section. It would be, seek those things which are above. That's part of how we get to the one body. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. That would be another highlight point. Again, remember we're talking about how do we get to this part where we let the peace of God rule and we're in the one body and we're thankful. We let set our affection on the things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Then the highlight, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. These are all actions, aren't they, that we're supposed to take. We're supposed to do something. When we're talking about the one body, sometimes we think of maybe, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We think of some other sections, maybe that section in Ephesians 4 where it talks about one body, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit, blah, 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 blah. It has all those things in there. We think about all these things. But how do we get to that one body? And this is how we get there. So we mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That's the other highlight section. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. I should get a plus for saying that. <laughs> and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. You know where that phrase, the children of disobedience, was used before? Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about that we were dead in sins and we were following the course that the adversary had set before us, the spirit of this world. The children of disobedience, that's what they do, that's not us. In which he also walked sometime, sometime, most of us live there all the time, when ye lived in them, but now ye also, the highlighted section, put off all these and then it names them anger, which is venom, indignation, it rises gradually, it becomes more settled, wrath, it boils up quickly, then subsides, impulse anger, malice, which is destructive evil with the intent to hurt, blasphemy, which is evil speaking, filthy communication out of your mouth, which is profane words, abrasive language, anything that tears down. 
Those are the things that it says for us to put off all these. We say, well, I don't do those. Well, maybe not. I think the longer you're in the Word and the more that Word permeates your life, you probably do do it less. But I catch myself at times when I get a little upset about something and I put some barbs in those words that I say, or I think evil thoughts. And if I'm thinking them, what comes out of my words, say? So sometimes that stuff still sneaks up. Then the other highlighted section, lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Why do we need to act that way if we've already put it off? And have, and then the underlying, and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor, or, nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In y'all. <laughs> I lived in Atlanta and Mobile, Alabama for some years, so the y'alls that I get to in the Bible that fit right in there. And then what does it say? Put on. That's the other highlighted thing. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy beloved, bowels of mercies, which is tenderness and compassion, kindness, which is gentleness, the opposite of severity, humbleness of mind, which is humility, meekness, which is the result of humility, long-suffering, which is patience, forbearing one another, which is bearing up and forgiving one another, if any man have any quarrel or formal cause of complaint against any, even as Christ forgave, graciously forgiving, implies grace involved, you, you, so also do ye. And above all these things, so above everything that we've highlighted in our Bible so far, what does it say? And this is the one I would highlight and underline circle and run arrows to. Put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. When we're talking about the one body, if we only, only walked in charity, you know what? Everything would be just fine. Because if I treat you with that love of God in my renewed mind, and I manifest that toward you, what am I going to do to harm you? Nothing. I'm going to esteem you more highly, right? For love's sake, it says. That's what it's all about. Now, now we get to this verse on the one body. Does it start to make a little more sense about how we get to the one body and what the one body is all about? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's the other underlined section. To the which also ye are called in one body. And now, because of all these things, we can be thankful. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more emotional, too. <laughs> wow. That's how peace rules, and we have harmony in the body, and we have thankfulness in our lives. As I was putting together this teaching, um, I was sitting at uh, Jim and Jones yesterday, and I'm working on my stuff, and I told Jim, I said, I want you to print out some stuff. It's just easier for me if I have everything here, so... I got through, and I said, oh, I scrapped the whole bottom of my teaching, so I'm starting it over. Because what I like to teach on is not only the topic, but how do we apply that in our lives now? We've actually read a lot of it. I mean, if you go through all those action things that it talks about earlier, we've read a lot of that already. But let's look at some things specifically. It's living the one body in our life. The very first thing that I think, and this isn't everything, I would say this is not an all-inclusive list of how to do this, but these are a few things that I thought about that I thought might bless you. I think the very first thing is that we better get straight if we're going to live in the one body, is we better understand who's the head of the body. You know what? It's not the ministry in your fellowship. It's not you, not your spouse. Um, it's not anybody. There's only one head, and guess who put him there? God. And that's his son, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who's qualified to be the head of the body. So any of us or anybody else that thinks that they're the head of the body or acts in that way, that's one of those ones where you just kind of take a couple steps back. And if you're looking in the mirror, you go, the old line, take a check up from the neck up, what's going on up here? because that's all starts up here someplace. 
I love what Pete said because I'd never heard that before. What's the opposite of hate? Selfishness. Because you think about all those things we put off, they all have their roots in that. What does it do for me? What do I get out of it? Even if it looks loving, but it's, I'm doing it because I need something to come out of it, it's selfishness. In the one body, the hand, don't looking out for number one. Actually, when where, who said that? I, oh, there he is. Yeah, I thought, no, it's looking out for one, two, three, four, five, you know, to scratch the back. So you got to watch out for that. The key to living in the one body is first recognizing who is the head of the body. It's not you, it's not me, it's not our ministry leaders, it's Jesus Christ. Without him as the head, we automatically break into divisions. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and they said also, I am of Christ. So some were saying, look, I am of Christ. And he still called that division. That's pretty interesting because it talked about be of one mind earlier in that section in Corinthians. Isn't that great? So wherever we start to have any issues in the one body, we ought to first start looking at who's the head in the situation that we're in with. Is it, are we looking to Jesus Christ for that? We're to be of one mind. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. We just talked a little bit about this. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Well, if I ask you your favorite baseball team, football team, hockey team, whatever it is, or your favorite singer is or something like that, we'd all have multiple opinions. So what? It doesn't make any difference. We're talking about what it takes as a body of Christ and to live God's word together, to live in that harmony and to have that peace of God, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. That's what we need to be of the one mind and one, what does it say, one mind and the same judgment. How do we accomplish this? We do it by rightly dividing the word of God and then teaching faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that's a point about the one body, which I'm going to make, I'm kind of jumping ahead in my own thinking, but I got something I want to share to wrap up things on that. But that's a critical key to the one body. The one body is not just us. And you know what? Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I don't want to take that away yet. So I'll get back to that one, but keep that one in mind. The third thing that we have to do to actually apply living in the one body is each believer must do their part in the body. That's so important. That's what it talks about in Corinthians. Well, I was sitting in this log cabin, I was thinking and looking around at it, at the beauty of the structure, because the one thing I like about log cabins is you can see the framework and how it works. How important is that center log that's running right across there for this framework? For those that are sitting under that section, that's a pretty important beam, right? That's pretty important. Well, what about that, you know, I was looking at this, what about that little piece of beam right there? Is that important? Yeah. Yes, it is. Why? Because it supports that beam right there. Now, what about the paneling that's over here? Is that important? It is, but is it holding the structure up? No. There's no real support on it, but if you think about it, the board below it is helping to support the one above it, right? So every part of this building, and that's why I said I love about a log home when you look at it, has a purpose generally. I mean, sometimes it's for looks, but generally there's a purpose in the structure of the building. Now, the big beam could say, look, because I'm the big beam and you're the little sideboard there, then I'm the important one in this, in this building, right? Same as the body. No, it isn't. Because that beam couldn't do it if the beam that was below it couldn't support it. And the foundation that this whole thing rests on is the foundation that's written in the word in Ephesians, which is the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. So kind of looking at it from a building perspective, it's pretty neat. Each one of us has a part to do in the one body. When the body doesn't work right, it causes massive problems. Our son, about 10 years ago, I shouldn't even talk about this because this is a big one. Um, 
If any of you are familiar in, in the medical stuff, it's called an AVM, an ar um, arterial venous malformation. And what it means is that there is a twisted, weird growth of arteries and veins. His was in the brain. It was about the size of a small lemon, about the size of a lemon. And what happens, a picture of Brillo pad of arteries and veins. I can see Julie back there nodding, so you're familiar with it, right? And what happens is it doesn't allow the blood to flow like it should. It works like a super highway for the blood, but it pushes that blood into the veins, which are not made to carry blood under those kinds of pressures. Most people end up dying from it because that those veins are to take the blood back. The arteries are to push it through, so that's where the pressure's at. He had this mass in there that he had all that, and he almost died because something went wrong in the body, and the body, for whatever reason, didn't do its part. We each do our part. In Romans chapter 12, I'll just read this because it's from the Amplified, four and six, four to six says, for just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we who are many are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts one of another mutually dependent on each other and since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us each of us is to use them accordingly so yes we are of the same uh, same mind and same judgment but your responsibility in the body is going to be different than mine but when we work together that's when it all comes together and it works perfectly we're to pray for one another I'm just going to read these verses because I'm running out of time. So I'm going to just sit, read these verses, but you know them all already. We pray for one another in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Do you think that Paul loved those people in Thessalonica? He gave thanks to God always for all of them. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. And then the last and the fifth one that I put down here was live and forgive, or love and forgive one another. Boy, you know, when my, um, if your body's not working right, my hand all of a sudden starts slapping my face. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what we do when we don't treat each other well. And so, you know, my face and my hand have to kind of say, I forgive you, and move on, <laughs> right? And move on. In 1 John 4, 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. We've been in 1 John 4 a lot uh, this weekend. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and Amplified, it says, Be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So when we talk about the one body, we can have our each individual unique things, but when we work together and we do those things that we've read about, what a great, great time. In Ephesians chapter 4, these are the last verses I'll read, and then I'll come back to that point I wanted to make. In Ephesians chapter 4, 14 through 16, this is from the literal and expanded translation. This is after it talks about the one body, one spirit, one Lord, the gift ministries, all these things. Why is all this? Why did God put all that together in Ephesians, the greatest book that was ever written to the church? It's because this is what he wants to have happen. This is the whole purpose of the ministry in the one body is that we no longer remain unlearned children tossed up and down doctrinally like waves on the sea changed by every doctrinal wind which is deceitful, like the dice playing of men, skillfully treacherous with systematic deception, which is their method, but truly strengthened in maintaining, speaking and teaching and living the truth in love, that we may develop and grow up in Christ, that everything he is we are who is the head, Christ. And from him, Christ, all the body being perfectly fitted together, and is being fused together by every joint, ligament, and tendon according to the standard of the gift working in full measure in every member. That's you. That's you. 
the full working in every member. When you're doing their part, that body, man, it's strong, it's tight, it's moving, and the head is directing every single one of you. Isn't that fantastic? According to the standard of the gift, working in full measure in every believer for the increase in Christ's body is building to be completely completed in love. When I was getting ready to do this, I was thinking about an example of how does a one body work. And I actually thought, I was telling Brian this last night, I thought of a symbiotic relationship. And, but that doesn't work. That's actually two bodies that either support one another, or sometimes both get benefits, sometimes one or the other. That didn't work. But what I thought about was the body itself. And I started thinking about the cells in our body. The cells regenerate all the time, right? The body that I was born with 64 years ago is not the same body I got today, obviously. <laughs> so um, it's not the same. It's not the same body it was 20 years ago. My wife goes, obviously. <laughs> the, old, the cells are constantly regenerating over and over and over again. I may have a brand new cell today in my pinky, but I might have an older cell in my toe. You know what? It's constantly regenerating itself and moving over and over again. I always thought of the one body as the people today that are in the Word. That's not true. The one body is from the day of Pentecost when those 12 apostles first spoke in tongues. You know what? They were part of the one body. The same body that's part of, that we're part of, right? Because Christ is the head of that body. And what I thought about... Sorry, I just... I look at some of you younger folks and I see how you're part of that regeneration of what's going on in the body. You know, that just blows my mind. That's where I was when I was 17 and got in the Word. A lot of you folks in here, I knew your parents and I knew a lot of your grandparents <laughs> that were in the Word that are no longer here today. You know what? They were part of that one body. And now you're part of that regeneration of that body, still under the head of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Wow. We had a fellowship um, with my grandson, who was a baby. <clears throat> but then we had a woman there that was 95. Wow. Part of the same body. She fell asleep just last year. But she was a wonderful woman. And she stood faithful up to the last day of her life. I don't know if I'll be around when Christ returns or not, but if I'm not, there's going to be a day where somebody else is going to be moving this along. And that's what excites me. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to share the word. God bless.